Mom, what's a pussy? Where did you hear that word? It was on a video case on top of the VCR. A pussy is a big light. For example, the pussy is switched off, the room plunges into darkness. Jason is my son, and today is his you birthday. You dinner with us. My brother makes good head cheese. Candyman, I get cheese. Candyman, Candyman. We all go a little mad sometimes. Hello and welcome to Two Guys, One Necronomicon, a weekly horror review podcast where we talk about all things horror. We talk about your cult classics to your modern day trash, and today we're discussing Dogtooth. And before we get started, I would just like to say, if you haven't already, please follow us on Facebook at Two Guys, One Necronomicon, and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Two Guys, One Necro. We are your hosts, Brian Hopwood LaGrasse and Shane the Railroad Tycoon Smith. Tip of the hat, I am very good at knowing how to get a railroad from Tennessee all the way out to California. I believe it. Shane knows the rails better than anybody. Tony Hawk, who are you? Tony Hawk, wouldn't you have been better saying like Eric Costin or something? Yes, much better. You're talking street versus vert. I used to skate, so Tony Hawk is kind of relevant there. I used to play the Tony Hawk games. So, that's my knowledge. Tony Hawk's fucking legit. He is. You know what else is legit? When your dog tooth falls out. Yeah, I mean, big things can happen when your dog tooth falls out. You can, like, leave your house. Yeah, I hope most of our listeners' dog tooth has fallen out so they can go out and experience the world. Because I remember growing up, it took until the age of 23 for my dog tooth to finally fall out and for me to leave the house for the first time. That's sick. I think my dog tooth fell out when I was like seven. Really? Yeah. So you have to experience everything. Did you get to drive a car? Because you can only leave if you do it in a car. That's true. Yeah. I got my license. I was 17. I, mean, I was able to leave. The instructor had to come to my house, obviously. I couldn't leave the property until I was able to drive a car safely. Exactly. And that's dog tooth. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so dog tooth is... Probably the only movie we've done so far that's not technically a horror film. There's very disturbing content in this movie. You can classify it as a horror, but it's not categorized as one. It's classified as a thriller, but to be fair, the movie's on Shudder, and I'm saying if it's on Shudder, we're going to be able to review it as a horror. I was going to make that point as well. It's like a drama thriller. It's very awkward, tense, and it really is just an insane piece of art and for the most part this movie has gotten pretty good critical reception yeah it does it's a greek film so you know it's going to be wild yes the whole movie is in greek so you will have to read subtitles to watch that movie just letting you know ahead of time doesn't take away from the movie that's for sure no absolutely not and it's a film directed by yorgos lanthimos and this is the same guy who directed the killing of a sacred deer the lobster i've never seen the lobster but killing a sacred deer was also really good and this guy's style is definitely similar in both movies. Yeah, except, like, Dogtooth was really interesting, and Killing of the Sacred Deer, I liked it, except when a certain person in the movie would put me to sleep. Oh my I won't name who, but I got tired every time she was on screen. So unfair, Shane. So unfair. In any case, what this guy does well is, he builds awkward tension insanely well. Like, yeah. Better than most. A lot of things happen where it's like, you don't want to look at it, but you can't look away. It's very, like, cringy, almost. But, like, a good cringe. It's not, like, a... Hard to watch. It's an interesting cringe. It's almost like a really dark comedy, in a way. Yes. Because you're like, wow, this could never happen. I'm sure that some sick families do some weird shit, but, like, to completely isolate your entire family, you don't want them to ever see the outside world, so you're gonna, like, reinvent your own world in your house and yard? It's pretty crazy. It makes me wonder, like, the whole basis is, like, these overprotective parents. Yes. Were they ever gonna let them out? No. Yeah. Because when you think of everything they teach them in this movie, they can never adjust to real-life society. Yeah. Yes, exactly. If you think about it, so the whole concept is they're gonna let them out once their dog tooths fall out, and... Your dog tooth is really your canine. Yeah. That's going to fall out with your baby teeth when you're when you're younger. younger. So when you're older... It's never going to fall out. It's never going to fall out. So the idea is they can only leave the house when the dog tooth falls out. But they can only 
get in a car and drive out safely if the dog tooth regrows back regrows in, back in, which is also impossible. Exactly. The kids don't know this because they're being taught by their parents. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So like you said, in the framework of overprotective parents, there's a theme here. It's a very interesting, almost paradigm because you know maybe this is a play on what people are learning in the outside world. Is it bad? Is it good? Should we maybe not teach kids so much in the home and let them learn outside if it's a parody on that? Or is it like, you know, maybe we just need better parenting in general because the outside world is bad. So I really don't know what the parody is. Is it what you learn outside or what you learn, you know, indoors? Yeah, it it almost takes on this whole like totalitarian like viewpoint where it's like you're being told this and you're expected to believe it no matter what, that you can't form your own opinion yeah, so there's like a tyrant aspect of yes, the father that, yeah. who's kind of controlling everything. It's almost like he wants to be God of his own place. Exactly. You yeah. Know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So there's some kind of like tyrannical government kind of comparison. And like I was saying, like, I don't know if this is like a value movie. Like, was a director going for, okay, well, parents can only teach you so much. You're going to learn everything that you grow up from in the outside world. Or is it on the inverse? We just need to teach our kids better because the outside world... It is scary. It's not scary to the degree that they're making it out to be. No, they're making it, they're blowing it out of proportion. And I would say, yeah, it's probably maybe a little bit of both because kids need to be able to learn certain things from both pieces, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm no psychologist, but I can tell you that they shouldn't be given, you know, sexual information or they shouldn't curse when they're young. That's something their parents should teach them. If they go out into the world too young and start hypersexualizing everything, you don't know what the kid's going to end up doing. It needs to be a healthy balance between learning stuff outside from other people and the parents guiding them and not overbearing. Because, you know, not in this movie where it takes it to extremes, but even in real life, overbearing parents, that's when kids are going to act out even more at times. Exactly. So like, you have to find that balance. Exactly. It's all about a healthy balance. A traditional structure in your family where like, you're learning enough from your family, but you're also not being completely controlled by them. Exactly. And you're learning from outside forces as well. You know, like your teachers and, you know, your good Samaritans out there. Exactly. Your ice cream men. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Clint Howard. <laughs> Love that movie. All right. So with all all that said, I think it's time to jump into the spooky pit. Three teenagers live in isolation as their parents tell them they can leave their home only when their dog tooth falls out. And right away, this movie opens with a tape recording. And it says four words. C, motorway, excursion, and carbine. Exactly, those four words. And then you learn their definitions of those terms. C is obviously a leather armchair with wooden arms. Yeah, it's definitely not like water. A motorway is a very strong wind. Yep. Excursion, a very resistant material used to construct floors. She uses it in a sentence. The chandelier fell violently onto the floor, but no damage was caused to it because it was made of 100% excursion. And see, I only buy my chandeliers... If they're made with 100% excursion. Why would you build it with anything else? It's the best way to build it. It's a very strong material. Yes, it is. And a carbine is a beautiful white bird, of course. Yeah. Now, every time I go to the beach, I say, hey, look at all those carbines uh, stealing sandwiches from the uh, people there. (laughs) So three teenagers are listening to this. And while they're listening to this, one of them, I think it's the older daughter... Just for uh, clarification, this is a movie where the five main characters don't have names. It's mother, father, older daughter, younger daughter, son. Yes. There will be one other character, and she has a name. Her name is Christina. So just to get you prepared for that, we're not going to be calling anyone by names. It's going to be older sis, younger sis, son. I think it's the older sis here. She says, let's play a game with hot water. It's the younger daughter. It's the younger daughter? Yeah. Okay. So she wants to play a game with hot water where they have to like take turns holding their finger under hot water and who can keep it under there the longest. I mean, brilliant idea. Let's just send your hands off. Who's in? I mean... I could see that being a game kids play as, like, who's the toughest. Yeah, maybe if you live under father's house. I'm just saying, like, kids do weird things like that. I could see it maybe being a thing. I don't. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll agree to disagree. You should burn your fucking hands off? I'm not saying I would do it. I'm just saying, you know, it's like 
something kids would do. It's like, yeah, like, okay, let's see, like, let's play the game where we put our hands down and we take a knife and we put them in between. Exactly, weapons. something like that. You know, you could be like, if Jimmy does, he's Jimmy Hot Hands now for the rest of his life. He's going to be Jimmy Hot Hands either way. He's either going to be burning his hands under the water. Or he's going to be fucking stabbed up. You know what? I think I'm going to start calling you Brian Hot Hands Lagrasta. It's actually kind of sexy. I like that. It's like my hands. Like, ooh, what are my hands going to do? They're going to burn you up? Yeah, because you held it under hot water the longest. Kill me. So the next scene is, you see a girl in like a security guard uniform, she's blindfolded and she's like the passenger of a car. The dad is the driver of this car. Yeah, and like everybody else, his name is father or dad, however you want to call him, but that's his name. He's asking her questions, you don't really see what he looks like yet, because he's kind of off screen. He asks her, you know, what's her favorite song, if she took a bath, if she washed her hair. She washed her hair yesterday, which is fair, you know, she might not have time to wash it today. So he pulls up to the gravel driveway and he has to unlock and unhook like this metal gate. He gets the car in and then he has to rehook it again. So clearly he doesn't want anybody leaving. He doesn't even want her to know where he's going. Doesn't want to know her. To That's why she's blindfolded there. during all of this. So the dad walks in on the son like working out with like a resistance band. Yeah, yeah. He's getting ripped. Yeah, he, he's, he's, he's getting shredded, and he's like, Christina is here. Right away, we start getting into the awkward scenes of this movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, big time. Because now Christina and the son are in the room, and they both just quickly undress. And you just get to stare at the son's ass for a while. Yeah. It's very awkward. They get on the bed without saying a word. Almost ritualistic. And then she starts the yanking process. So he's sitting, like, Indian style, and she's, like, sitting with just her legs over him, and she's just stroking. No sound. No, it's just, you're just watching these two stare at each other awkwardly on a bed, stroking. And is this a passion bump? Not yet. Oh my god, I know what scene you're referring to, and I almost just threw up. Are we gonna get sick, or no? I think we might. So, eventually the biology's gonna take over, and he's gonna get on top of her, and they're gonna make sweet, sweet, sexy time. And by sexy time, she lays down flat, puts her hands, and, like, holds the headboard, while he, like, awkwardly shuffles over her, and just thrusts. Yeah, it's, like, just, it's just two people pancaked and thrusting. Yeah, it's like, neither one wants to be there. Maybe he's trying to learn something. She does not want to be there. Well, you'll find out she's getting paid to be there. Exactly. And all you hear is the creaking of the bed. I don't even think they make a noise. Maybe there's like a slight like moan or like a slight like ah. She ah. definitely doesn't make a noise. <laughs> or breathing. But there's just, you just hear the creaking of the headboard. It makes the sex seem so gross. Which I think is obviously the point. Yes. So then Christina goes and talks to one of the daughters. I believe what the daughter says to her, you know, it looks like you've lost some weight. I mean, that's a nice thing to say, right? Yeah, it is. And then they discuss the shining stones in her hair, which is a headband. She's got this shining headband, and the older sister likes this headband. And the older sister says, will you be joining us for dinner? We're having burgers. And that's her favorite. But she can't. She has to go home. Yeah. Then the other daughter comes in and brings Christina apple juice, but it looks like orange juice. Yes. Yes. And that's where... I'm like questioning, did he switch the fruits on them too? I wouldn't like, doubt it. Yeah. And I love it because you think it's just them. And then the camera opens it and the mother and father are there on the couches on the sides. Because the, the father is like now filming the two of them sit. And she's like, the one door is like, oh wait, I want to sit next to Christina too. Yeah, so they swap seats and the father's like, Christina, give me more of a smile. So she like enlarges yeah. the smile. Then the brother hops on the couch and sits with them. Like, in a movie where everyone is super awkward, he's the most awkward. The son, yeah. Yeah. And he's got, like, such a void of expression on his face. He's like a blank slate. Yeah. So then this is where, like Shane mentioned, father's gonna pay Christina out in the car. He gives her the blindfold. And then you get, like, a voiceover of the father teaching and testing them. The son and the oldest daughter, they're, like, play fencing out in the yard. Mm -hmm. And the younger daughter is cutting up a girl doll. And this is kind of creepy. Yeah, because she cuts off one foot and then goes, ah! She starts screaming as she's literally cutting up the doll. And then cuts off the other foot and goes, ah! Nice, dude. Not bad. I didn't know how loud to get. <laughs> I didn't want to scare the listener. But that's fair, though. She does it just like that. Yeah, it's like a shriek. But she's so like, she's 
trying to feel the pain of the doll. I think, yeah, honestly. So then the son, he's all dressed up and he's looking at his headboard and he sees like all these stickers he has. Because you will learn that they compete in certain aspects and the reward is stickers. The father gives stickers. Like they're kindergartners, essentially, still. They don't get an allowance, they get stickers. They're supposed to be teenagers, but they're still treated as if they're five. Yeah, so the girls are also dressing up as well because they need to dress up for dinner. Because it's super formal. Yeah, even though they're just having burgers. And then conversation talk at the dinner table is always a plus at this house. I'd love to say like the last name, but since there's no last name, I gotta just say at the house. <laughs> yeah. Because their names are like father, mother, daughter, son. Daughter. Younger daughter. <laughs> uh, and they like talk about like things that they need the father to pick up that they've run out of. They call salt a phone. Because <laughs> yeah. they say, can you pass the phone? And it's... The thing is salt. I gotta chuckle because his son is like, he needs black tint for his eyebrows. He's like, he can't use blue. That would be unnatural. And the father chuckles. Yeah. <laughs> I just think about playing like, oh, that's unnatural, but none of the shit that's yeah, going yeah, on it, is. It's so like messed up, topsy turvy. It's just like, it's all over the and place. And what you said is so funny. Cause the younger daughter's like, hey, mother, pass the phone. The salt shaker. <laughs> Gives her a salt shaker. And then they do like a, a sticker count. The son has 76 stickers. The youngest daughter has 37 and the oldest is 52. So son is the winner again and he chooses tonight's entertainment. And what does he suggest? He suggests video time. Uh, so basically they just watch this grainy family recorded video. It's just a video of them living their lives. And the one they have seen this video so much, the one daughter mouths Recycling. every line yeah. that is about to come out. So they're watching their own family videos. That's video time in the house. So then we cut to the brother washing the car. He's giving it a good scrub. He's giving it a very deep cleanse. But then he starts to stare at a bush and says, I wash the car better than you. You don't wash the car as good as me. I get under the seats and I, I scrub the floor mats. I think he's practicing like an argument, but... He's supposedly talking to his brother. That's right. I completely forgot about that. Yeah. So they have this like created brother that's like... On the other side of the fence. Because then he starts to throw rocks over the fence. And the parents see that he's throwing like rocks over the fence. Apparently he's like throwing them at his brother. Right? That's what he's supposedly doing. Yes. So the parents see this and they like get upset with the brother. The real brother, not the fake one over the fence. So they make him put mouthwash into his mouth and just hold it there. Yeah, that's tough because Listerine fucking burns. Yeah. So like he takes it, he leaves it in his mouth for a while and he wants to spit it out. His mother's like, nope, you hold it, you hold it. And then like after like a minute, he's able to spit it out. Yeah. So it's interesting. What's also interesting and I got to say is, you know, when you said he's throwing the rocks, the way this place is like is built, is it's a big house and there's like very tall wooden fences surrounding it so they have no means of escape you know what the yard reminds me of maybe you'll disagree the yard from the human centipede yeah no no i agree it looks exactly like that setup and there's even scenes in this movie that kind of reminded me of human centipede it's got a very human centipede like tone for yeah. sure after the mouthwash the girls and the brother are laying outside and they see a plane fly over and the one daughter says i wish it would fall so i can get it and then that's what I'm thinking. Uh, they've probably been told those planes are like toy planes in yeah. the sky. They're not real people. But the mother slaps her directly in the face and says, whoever deserves it will get the plane. Yeah, I mean, she's jumping the gun here. I mean, that's that's pretty tough parenting. All she says is she wanted to get the plane. I don't think you need to slap her across the face. And at this point, father is ready to put in a nine to five. Yeah. So he's leaving. And they have like this drop down gate. So like the gate comes up. Right, and he exits, the gate closes. You see Christina's the security guard there. Yeah, so at his workplace environment, where you get in to kind of like get to parking, there's that divider you can't cross until the person at the toll yeah. lets you in, the toll booth or whatever it is. And she works there. She's the officer in that booth. That's how he knows her. The dad asks, are you wearing the perfume I got you? And apparently this perfume is hidden. She is wearing it, and he wants to give it a sniff. Does he give it a sniff? He does, right? Yeah, he gives it a little... Yeah, he, a little, smel he smells it. He gives it a sure. little sniff. Yeah. And it's interesting because this guy is actually living a normal life. A normal life. From 9 to 5. From 9 to 5. 5, 10, he turns it up. Yeah. He turns it up to 11. He does his work stuff. One of the sisters says her belly has been aching and she thinks it could be her appendix. So then the other sister just starts like squeezing it in different places to find out where it hurts. And I'm like, you know, that's very doctor of her. She knows exactly what she's doing. Oh, yeah. 
Because she does have, like, a little, like, diagram of, like, the body. Exactly. And after feeling around and acknowledging the origin of the pain, it's much higher than where the appendix is. Which is fair. I think she kind of gets that right. Yeah, but her treatment, it's kind of flawless. Basically, don't exercise and don't eat fruits and vegetables. That's the solution. I've never heard someone say don't eat fruits and vegetables before. So... I don't know what the dad's teaching them. Who knows? And then the most interesting part of this scene happens. They chloroform themselves. It's a new game they're playing. Who's the quickest to wake up from being chloroformed? So they sniff it and they just knock out. Now, this is a game I used to play all the time in my youth. Like, I remember me and my buddies. I'd be like, hey, Max, hey, Jackson, whip out the chloroform. Let's see who wakes up fastest. Jackson was so good at that game. Yeah. None of these people are real. I didn't actually chloroform myself. I know you did. Full disclaimer, I don't want the kids listening to go chloroform themselves now. Where do you even get that shit? Uh, Walmart? Really? I don't know. They sell everything else. No, they definitely don't sell Walmart. No, that's some sick shit. Father tells another employee at his job, his wife is not well, and that's why he hasn't invited him over. Yeah, he has this, like, whole backstory where his wife is in a wheelchair, even though she isn't. The guy says, like, you guys should get out more, though, still. But he says, no, we can't do that. He's like, listen, my wife, she was a handball champion, but, you know, yeah, she had an accident. I would love to actually know if she was a handball champion. We'll rewrite it. We're gonna, okay. So, the wife is this handball champion, and one of her teammates is just as good But she has two kids who get into a horrible car accident. And this leads her to go into the spiral of depression because she's also currently pregnant with triplets. Okay. So when she gives birth to them, she's like, these kids will never, ever, ever go outside. And this starts the whole cycle of keeping them inside. Exactly. Is she married at this point? Oh, yeah. And the dad is... He's just bought in. He's bought in, and he's actually going to take... Because he loves handball so much, he doesn't want to lose his wife. Yeah. So he'll do whatever she says. Of course. Yeah, I got it. Makes sense. I'm I'm glad you're buying in. You know who wouldn't buy in? That son of a bitch, Mike J. He would rewrite and make some stupid thing like handball or dick. Yeah, he makes it super sexual all the time. Yeah, it doesn't need to be super sexual. Sometimes you just need to rewrite it in a nice and messed up way where a family dies in a car accident. and That's what spawned all these events. Mike G, what an asshole. So mother is going to lock the room behind her at this point. She's going to take a phone out of a cabinet. The phone's never hooked up. But she takes it out and she hooks it up because she wants to call her husband. She's like, listen, the oldest girl has a stomach issue. At this point, the oldest daughter, she's like hearing from the outside of the door, which is like she's trying to get some information on what she's doing. Then the scene transitions. The father is trying to get his dog back from this trainer. Yeah. So like you see like a Doberman, I think it is like just attacking like someone in a dog suit. Like you see all these like vicious dogs and the dad's like, I want my dog back. The guy goes through this whole spiel of how your dog's on stage two. It has to get to stage five. Five. It's leading up to this dog, and it's this cute little white dog. A docile white dog named Rex. And he's, like, calling out to it, and it's, like, supremely unresponsive. Yeah. So clearly the dog needs to get to the next stages. Interesting fact. The daughter, the actress, is named Mara Tassani. Unfortunately, she passed away, I think, in 2017. She had a punk band. It was called Mary and the Boy, and one of her band members was that dog instructor. I actually thought you were going to say the dog. Like, you know, just think of a little dog shredding on the guitar. Yeah, bro, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm a dog. Look at me. Whoa. So then the dad leaves there, and we see him get back to the house. He has water in the trunk, but he cuts the labels off. Of course. And I guess that's because he doesn't want them reading, like, the contents of, like, what's in there. Yeah. Because if they see, like, salt, they'll be like who's on the phone or something like it's gonna mess up with the whole linguistic teachings that he's yes. been giving them which, which the director does a good job of doing that because like that's also why they don't watch outside movies yeah because then the language would make no sense to them they have to watch their own home movies because that's the language they know yeah so he keeps everything on the level never to get off track he's created this whole world of language and just really as a way to protect them. It wouldn't even help them if, like you said, if they get out in the real world, it's going to be super fucked up. But this is all to create his own place here, create their own language, keep them here forever. Okay. And this next scene, I kind of want to start a new segment. I want to call it the anti-passion bump. You weren't into this? So the dad and the mom, they're in bed together. And they both put on, like, music with, like, headphones on. And then they stay fully clothed, but they take their underwear off from under their clothes. And then they just kind of lay on top of each other. 
And I'm just super not into it. They're getting the work, Shane. They don't even talk to each other. They're just... They just know. It's like instinct. It's, it's what they do. It's the anti-passion. Whatever. They just don't look like they're into... No one looks like they're having fun. No. Sex in this household is... It's such sad a, and depressing. So dull. So now the son is blindfolded in the house. The oldest daughter is now blindfolded in the pool. The younger daughter is blindfolded in the yard. Mother is yelling out. Is she yelling out time? She's timing them. Yeah. To how long it takes for them to get where they are respectively to her. They all do get there, but it takes them about five and a half minutes. Youngest daughter, oldest daughter, and then son in that order. In the kitchen, oldest daughter, she's like wearing these white clothes... She takes two slices of chocolate cake and puts a slice in each pocket. Yeah, because she's got to feed the brother over the fence. So she takes pocket cake and she throws it over the fence. And I know you're a big guy when it comes to pocket cake. Yeah. Because, you know, whenever we go to a concert or we're like, you know, we're going on a trip, you always have the pocket cake on you. I always travel with pocket cake. And by pocket cake, I actually just mean granola bars. That's actually just true. Yeah, I know. It's the most true thing you've ever said on this podcast. Probably is. From Pocket Cake, we go back to Dad picking up a blindfolded Christina. And obviously, she's there to do one thing and one thing only, and that's meet up with the brother. Yes. They're sitting together, and he's like, he can't, he can't do it. I think what she was asking is for him to perform oral sex on her. To go a little south. Yeah. So I guess she's like, she's like, maybe we could try to get like into this. Like, you know, warm her up a little bit, but he's not, he's like, I just want to do the same thing as last time. Use your tongue. There's no point otherwise, but he's not into it. He's like, don't tell father. She's not into it. When he says, let's do what they did last time, she just gets into the doggy style position. Yeah, and this is where you realize the brother is a very selfish lover. Yeah, it's true. He's a selfish lover. Kind of reminds me of Mike J. Then we get to a very interesting scene because then Christina goes into the sister's room again and she's like, hey... I know you like my headband. Would you be willing to trade? And I know you love a good barter. I do. And the oldest sister, believe it or not, well, you'd classify as the rebellious one of the, of the a teenagers. Doubt. And she's learning some things that you wouldn't learn from Pops and Ma. She's going to learn some negotiation skills here from Christina. This is not what father intended, obviously. Christina's solely there to have sex with the kid. Yeah. But Christina is willing to give the sister the headband if she starts to lick her. Now, she does agree because she sits on the bed and she just shows her where to lick. And then she kind of licks like a dog. Yeah. Because she's just licking. Like She's licking it. And that's it. She kind of looks back at a Christina, maybe getting some approval. That's it, yeah. And now you're thinking passion bump. No. So you're not thinking passion bump. These scenes are so awkward. Where do you freaking give a passion bump? Well, I know what you were thinking. I thought it was this one. I guess we're waiting a little longer. The two girls discuss mom talking to herself. Because they don't realize when she's in a room locked in there, she's talking on the phone to dad. The one who just got the headband offers the headband to the other sister if she licks her now. It's like the lick trade. Yeah. Except now, she's like, where do you want me to lick you? We're getting shoulder lick. Lick my shoulder. I don't think she's made the connection between the, the licking and the pleasure that you get. No, 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 no. She does eventually, but not yet. Youngest daughter will lick her shoulder. Licking is a very common theme in this movie. Yeah, it is, for sure. Because there's a lot more scenes coming up with licks. So that mother is talking on the phone to the father again, and she asks him to bring chocolate home from what I gather. It's something like that. I don't think it's like really that important. I don't think it comes into play anywhere. I think it's more so just building up, right, that she has the phone, because eventually the sister does find the phone. And the phone is in whose room? Is it in the mother's room? The mother's room. It's in the mother's room. One thing that does happen here is that the brother is playing outside with a toy plane, and the older sister notices that's her plane. The older sister, like, jumps on top of the brother to try to get the plane from him. And I'm not sure, like, why she does this, but when she gets the plane from him... She throws it outside the gate. Yeah. I thought she wanted to keep it, or was she just jealous that the brother had a plane? Probably. But she's really jealous, though, because when the brother then chases her inside, she slices him with a knife. Yeah, right in his arm. So he runs up to him and just gets a good, clean slice of his arm. The blood actually squirts to the wall. And then you see see mother. She's slapping the shit out of the oldest daughter for this. Which, I don't condone hitting your kids. Me neither. But she did just cut her brother's arm with a knife. I mean, I do believe in discipline. I don't believe in, like, really, like, hitting your kids. No, but, but that that was uh, extreme. That was very extreme. By the pool, the son is talking to the younger daughter, who is riding her back. I, I don't know what to add to that. Uh, she asks if it hurts. 
He says no. She tells him to ask father to get him the plane. Yeah. Which is your favorite scene in this movie. Because the father, he's like, I'll get it. He gets in his car, pulls up like five inches, gets out, picks up the plane, gets back in his car, and then backs up five inches. I do love it. And now, why do you have to drive in the car? I mean, we know now because... because yeah, the whole idea is you can leave the home when your dog tooth falls out, but like you're only safe to like actually leave when the dog tooth goes back to you to use the car. He's like actually like using the whole... The, yeah, the whole he's doing process. the whole thing. So like you can't even like reach over because he easily could have just reached over. He's at the precipice of the end of the yard yeah. to get into the driveway. He doesn't exceed that point. Like he, he is like really selling this. So in the middle of the night, the son, he hears something in bed and decides to just sleep with his mother and father. He kind of gets in the middle of them, gives his dad the old arm around them. Yeah, I mean, he's a little too old to be sleeping in between his parents. Yeah, but they welcome it. They do, because they're all weird. So we cut to the next day, and probably one of the hardest scenes to watch in the movie, especially if you're an animal lover. Yeah, the cartwheels. Those are some really shitty cartwheels he's doing. Yeah, but I'm not referring to the cartwheels. I'm referring to... The cat. This guy hasn't seen many movies, but I think he's seen The Burning because he gets the hedge clippers. And he starts backing up in absolute fear of the cat at first. Like he said, grabs the hedge clippers. He lunges at the cat and the cat does not move. No. He's a friendly cat. Yeah. He stabs the cat with the hedge clippers. Yeah. They show the hedge clippers inside the cat's gut and there's blood. And the two sisters like scream from inside the house. I actually found out the cat was blind and that's why it didn't move. There's no way you're charging at a cat. Why wouldn't it move? Why wouldn't it move? The cat was actually blind. Interesting. But they didn't actually stab a cat, right? It was all fake. I hope not. I would hope not too. Yeah, I I, we don't, we didn't want a cannibal holocaust on our hands here. After that whole disturbing scene, the uh, dad is outside the home and he's cutting his clothes. He needs to set an example. So he rips his clothes apart. He starts getting like this red paint and he smears it like all over his dress shirt. He covers himself. And then when he goes into the family, he says, a creature killed your other brother. That creature was the fearsome cat. And he goes on to describe that the cat eats human flesh and preys on children. Yeah, it's got sharp teeth, it destroys the body, and he eats the face of the victim, so they're like, fear the cat. And it kind of sounds like your upstairs cat. Pretty much. So, in a way, he's not completely lying. And he reinforces it, he's like, listen, you guys are only protected in the house in case it invades the house or the gardens, and then starts woofing. And then the entire family gets on all fours and woofs like a dog. And this is where I was thinking of, like, the human centipede. With them all on all fours, like, wolfing. The only thing left was the dad to sew them ass to mouth. Like, that's all that was needed at this point. It's a pretty, like, disturbing scene. Because even seeing the mom get on all fours with them and, like, do this. She knows what's happening. Well, yeah, she's, she's selling it. But it's, like, just crazy to see it all happening. Well, their long-lost, extremely real brother that they have mm -hmm. on the other side, they're giving it a memorial service for it. So they go over to the fence. And the kids, they say a few words about they wish that they could have saved him. The oldest daughter mentioned that she hoped that she'd survive, that she could get supplies for him. Oldest daughter is then teaching son about CPR. They're by the pool. They're practicing on the older daughter. They just keep practicing on each other. And then yeah, they keep going through the motions and they even do the mouth to mouth. I'm like positive you're not supposed to practice CPR on like living people. Like I think that's bad for the chest, especially because you could break someone's ribs doing that. Yeah, I'm not even worried about the mouth to mouth with them being brother and sister. I'm just thinking a proper etiquette of doing CPR if they're not doing it right. You're not that's supposed fair. to practice on real that's people. That's fair. So let's watch them porn on the couch. At least that's what father and mother are doing. Yeah, uh, up close, you do see a woman's mouth just licking a penis. It's just That's right true. there. And then you see the mom on the couch topless, and I believe you can see the dad's penis. Like, at least some of it, right? Because he's not wearing pants. Yeah. And, you know, here on Two Guys One Necronomicon, we like to give you everything in grave detail. So you need to know what we're seeing. You need to experience it for yourself as well. Which, like we said at the beginning, if you want to see this movie, it's on Shudder. Do they go at it here, or they kind of just, like, no. watch together? Yeah, they watch, because she got an important announcement. She's pregnant. That's right. With twins, a boy and a girl. And then he's like, two boys? She's like, no, boy and a girl. 
And he's like, are you sure? And she's like, yes. He's like, triplets. He's like, that's a bit much. And he's like, okay, right, twins. They're just weird. Like, first of all, I don't even know how she knows that she's having a boy and a girl. Well, she's got that psychic pregnant ESP. He's trying to like just say triplets, like to magically yeah. procure triplets in her. I guess. So then we cut to the dad telling the three kids to stay underwater. Pool exercise. Yeah, well, whoever stays on the water longest gets a sticker. It's all about the stickers. And I think that they mentioned that the next sticker is going to be a 10 sticker payout. Dude. You know I love a good 10 sticker payout. Downfall for these kids is even the winner was worse timing than last time. They didn't do as good as they did before. And that's a real shame. Because the dad wants to see market improvement. Of and course. he's not seeing that. No. He's seeing a dip in performance. And then he tells them, he's like, listen, in a few months, mother will be giving birth to twins and a dog. On the negative, they'll have to share rooms and toys with you. On the positive, you will have extra support. The family will be bigger. Applaud your mother for this wonderful gift. And both sisters voice their opinions to father and mother. Like, they don't want to share rooms with this new person, this new kid. And father says, if you behave, you won't have to. And mother says, if you behave, she may even avoid having birth. But no matter what, she is birthing that dog. The dog is coming out, no matter what. Pool exercise, and they all earned a prize. And father's handing out stickers. And then, as you mentioned, even though their performance was not as good as the last one, mother then throws an airplane onto the yard. And there's actually an airplane in the sky. She throws it, like, literally in the yard. Like, yeah. almost on. So the kids race to see who can get to the airplane first to pick it up. One of the sisters gets there. I always forget which one's which. It's the older sister. She actually trips the son who's about to get it, and then she grabs it. Well, they hate each other for the most part. It always seems like. Yeah. So then we cut to the sister laying on the other one in between her legs with her head resting on her vagina. And then she starts to, like, gnaw on her inner thigh. Yeah, she's sucking on the inner leg. Now, I wouldn't even say sucking. I think she's, like... Biting it a little? Biting? Yeah, it looks like she's biting it a little. Because she says, not that hard. Because she has her, like, ease up on the bite. And then she asks her to start licking her. Look for a present. This seems to be the new thing. Yeah. She's like, I have nothing to give you. But she's like, you know what? I'll just do it anyway. So she starts licking, like, right above her waist. And, like... She points the various parts in her stomach to lick. So they're starting to work on their licking spots. A sentence I never thought I'd say in a movie. The next day, father's lounging outside, and the older daughter... Starts clipping his toenails. Which is probably the grossest scene in the movie. But he starts to belt out a beautiful song. Yeah, he's a good singer. He's been practicing. And then father lets fish out into the pool without anybody to know. I love this because the younger daughter does run in. She finds the fish. She's like, Dad, I see two fish. Sea bream in the water. And she's like, Mom will be so happy when she sees this. So the dad goes out there with her. And she's like, oh, look, there's a third fish now. And the dad has a snorkel and a fucking harpoon. <laughs> Love it. And he is going in. Like, yeah, he dives in with a harpoon. And I'm like, a net would have sufficed. Need the harpoon. At dinner, father has a few questions for the kids. He does, like, these little questions and tests. The most creative years for a man. What's the answer, Shane? It is 30 to 40. Most creative years for a woman. 20 to 30. A child is ready to leave the house. Only when the dog tooth falls out. Left or right, doesn't matter which dog tooth. No, it does not. And obviously to this point... They're literally never going to leave or have a normal life. Correct, because their dog tooth is never falling out. Especially since then it has to regrow. Exactly. Only then is your body ready to face the dangers that lurk. To be safe outside, they'll need to learn how to drive a car. When they're ready to drive, they need their right dog tooth to grow in again. Or the left, it doesn't matter. It's got to regrow like you said. Then the oldest daughter just asks her mother, what's a pussy? Obviously a pussy is a big light. She's telling me it's a big light. Pussy is switched off. The room plunges into darkness. And then father's like... You want to hear your grandfather sing? And then starts throwing on Frank Sinatra. Then we get a little dancing between the mom and the two daughters. You know, it's a a, a touching scene, maybe? It's nice. I actually can't say any of the scenes in this movie are touching. It's, I I guess, wholesome for this fucked up family. Hmm. And then we cut back to Christina being uh, back there. And she tells the brother she saw him in a dream. Yeah, she was in the woods with their father having fire roasted potatoes. They hear like a noise coming from a brush. It was his son. And his son was a zombie. And then father threw rocks at him and she did as well, but they couldn't hit him. And then she asks him if he has any dreams. And he's like, yes, my mom fell into a pool. And then? My mom fell into a pool. That's it. That, yeah. That, that's the dream. So, Christina's had enough of this. So, she goes to the sister's room again, and she's like, Oh, I brought hair gel for you. Automatically just drops her pants, assuming this is a good deal. Christina is getting a little ahead of herself here. She thinks automatically now, if she brings anything, she's going to make a trade. But the sister is now well-versed in bartering. Oh, yeah. 
She doesn't want the trade. It's not worth it. She also says that the gift you gave her previously, the headband, that shit doesn't sparkle. Yeah, so she wants a better present. And she even, she starts to call her out. She's like, if you don't give me like a better gift, I'm going to tell my dad that you made me lick your keyboard and that you gave me the headband. And that's when I realized their vagina is called a keyboard. So she's trying to barter. She wants to take that the girl has two movies and because of that little vague threat she gets those videotapes now do we ever know what those videotapes are yes we do okay jaws and rocky four that's right yeah that's right it does make sense for the later scenes Mm. i think the sister then licks to get those tapes obviously because you know a lick for a you know videotape that's how i got on this podcast i'm like bry i heard you want to do a podcast can i do it with you he's like yeah but you have to lick. Podcast for lick, boy. Yeah. I think it was a good deal. Cuts now. The son is asking his mom what a zombie is because he heard Christina say that. And she's like, where'd you hear that word? He's like, I don't know. Probably dad. She's like, a zombie is a small yellow flower. And then I love this scene because it makes me realize this guy can drink an infinite amount of orange juice. Why is that? He downs one. His mother pours him another glass. He downs another. Yeah, no one drinks orange juice that fast. The oldest daughter tries to watch the tapes in the living room, but she like, hears a noise and she like takes it out because mm-hmm. her father enters. She's like, what are you doing up so late? And she's like, oh, I was feeling very tense. He tells her there's nothing to worry about as long as you don't go into the gardens alone. It's dangerous. So the next day she mentions how she wants to learn how to fight. And this does make sense now with the Rocky because she like imitates him like she does the jaw thing and she like starts swinging away if you don't know what the movies are you're never gonna understand the scenes but she's recreating like the dialogue and the scenes from those movies that she just watched. yeah the rocky movies like she throws punches she like looks exactly like stallone also punches water out of her own mouth yeah she does she then starts quoting Jaws when she's by the pool, and she does like this weird reenactment, making her hands like a part of the shark, and she actually bites her brother. Yeah, she like out of the pool, and she starts like chasing him as a shark, and he's having none of this. Does she feel guilty because she brings the videotapes to her father? She must. She's not compelled to. She just literally hands her father the two videotapes. So the father's like, "Get me the duct tape." She gets him the duct tape. He ties duct tape around his hand that's right next to the the VHS. Tape. So he duct tapes the VHS to his hand. And just starts cracking over over the head with it repeatedly. Like, like CTE inducing cracks. He's wailing on her with this VHS. Like the sound it makes. Like you hear like the plastic breaking as it's just beating her over the head. It's, it's crazy. Like if she didn't remember parts of the movie, she will now because it's literally been beaten into her head. (laughs) Nice. Thank you. See what I did there? Yes. The scene's going to shift and the scissors are both together now. And the older sister's like, please call me Bruce from now on. So this is interesting. She starts getting like various positions. And every time the younger sister calls her Bruce, she reacts to the name Bruce. Yes. And this is what I take the scene as. Now that she's seen these movies and seen people with names, she wants like her own name. Yeah, she wants her own identity. And that's why she, no one's called her anything. So when she's called Bruce, she's reacting like you would like, Yes, you need me. It's like her getting an identity for the first time. She's the character, like I said, is going to try to subvert through all like watching these videos, bartering with Christina. She's getting these outside influences and it's challenging the rules set by their parents. The problem is that's all going to stop now because the dad goes to Christina's house and he basically confronts her about giving the VHSs to his daughter. And the dad, he's like, do you live alone? She's like, my parents live on the fourth floor. All right. Let me check out your VHS player. What do you got over here? And he beats her with the VHS. Yeah. And this is like a big 1990s VHS player. It's a hulking mess. It's a monstrosity. You don't see her head, but you just imagine she's just covered in blood. Oh my God. He rocks her with it. And it's interesting because right before he leaves, he says something very, very interesting. He goes, I hope your kids have bad influences and develop a bad personality. I wish this with all my heart as punishment for the evil you have caused my family. Which obviously is insane because all she did was let her watch Jaws and Rocky. Poisonous. Poison the family. Uh, no? Family was fine before she came on. Okay. So let's break this down. Because this family was not fine. Oh my god. I'm not saying Rocky's the best movie of all time, but I wouldn't call it poisonous to the family. You think calling, I don't know, phone salt shakers is weird? I think that's completely normal. Well, I mean, you judged me for liking the water burn game. That was fair, though. I don't think it was. Hmm. Hmm. Huh. 
Huh. There we go. So where the fuck are we now? Screams in the middle of the night wake up both parents. They run into their son's room. The son is writhing in pain and said his sister has been hitting him with a hammer. The younger sister says that's not true. She came in and she saw a cat with a hammer jump out of the window. Yeah, and I was like, holy shit, I can't believe Brian's cat got into that window. Oh my god. But what I like is like, obviously the parents know the sister is full of shit. Has to be. But have to buy in they to got, sell their story. They gotta keep the narrative. So if the girl's on the up and up, she's gonna keep fucking doing this. Exactly. Now, why do you think the girl keeps attacking the brother like this? Is it just like an act out because of her situation? Yeah, like, is uh, it just like a... Or does she just really hate him? Like, or is it just like... Essentially, it's her only way of being like a rebellious teenager. I think so. And then she tells him, you know, he's lying. He's hallucinating from the pain. And then she'll need, you know, some analgesics, some plaster. But she does believe it's broken. Father closes the window and like he said, he goes along with He has to corroborate her story in order to keep his little... Lie alive. Lie alive. Exactly. The scene's going to transition to the father telling mother, he's like, you devote less time to the kids. Don't cry. You don't want the kids to see you crying. Mother sits on his lap. She actually just starts licking the side of his face. Yeah, I told you, licking comes back. He tells her they can't trust an outside source to replace Christina's role. And he's considering having the eldest take that position up. Yeah. Void the film. But the mother suggests to let the brother decide who he'd rather have. Now this scene. The brother is sitting in the bathtub naked. You don't see him. The way it's filmed, you see the tub and you just see him, like, sitting in it the wrong way. So then the two sisters come on screen, naked, and sit side by side. Yeah, it's like one's on one side of him in the bathtub, the other one's on the other side. And the brother feels both of them up, breast and ass, to decide which of the two he rather have. Weirdest scenes of the movie. It's such a like, long, like, fucking squeeze. It's just fast forever. That's why I said at the beginning of the review. It's, like, cringy to watch, but it's, like, it's there for a reason. Absolutely. It's just, you feel awkward watching oh it. Oh, my God. So awkward. But it works. So, obviously, the brother picks one of them because in the next scene is the mom combing her hair and, like, putting makeup on her. Exactly. She's getting ready for the big plow. So then... She opens the door to the son's room. The oldest daughter, completely, you know, made up in the new outfit and the new makeup, sits down next to him and he takes off his pants. He helps her take off her dress and the son guides her hand to his junk and he assists her to stroke it. Yeah, so you don't see anything yet. But as she's stroking, you actually see the penis get hard and the hand come up with it. And I'm assuming what is an actual scene of... I don't know how you fake it. You you don't, right? No. So, since it's real... Oh! Passion bump! Passion bump! Passion bump! Ah, my G. Once it's over, she says, you do that again and I'll rip your guts out. Yeah, she says that, and then she's like, this clan won't last long in this neighborhood. Because I think the idea is, she's been watching movies now, yeah. so she's creating, like, a movie-like quote for her reality. Yeah, because there's a scene coming up where I think it's a dance I've seen in a movie before. Oh, no, for sure. Yeah. So, now what I was going to go to is the brother is in the yard, and he finds two little zombies. Now, I'm not going to tell you what he finds. You should be paying attention to know what zombies are by now. He keeps calling out for mom. He's like, you want these? <laughs> but then we cut to the sister who finally finds the phone in the parents' room. And she has no idea what this is because she thinks phones are salt. For all we know, this could be the jackhammer. It could be a pipe. It could be a bed sheet. Yeah, it could be anything. She plugs the jack in though. She knows how to hook it up. She starts pressing random buttons. And then I guess she gets somebody because she like immediately hangs up. Yeah, she gets scared when she hears another voice. Uh, that's what I assumed it was. Then we cut to the two sisters talking. And the one sister is saying, I think my dog tooth is falling out. Yeah, the younger sister actually gives like her tooth like a pull. And she's like, yeah, you're imagining things. And then the scene shifts to the party right now. Because this is the celebration of their anniversary, right? Yeah. And this is like the scene that drew me in from the trailer. Yeah. Because it's so weird. And I was like, I need to see this movie. Oh, yeah, for sure. The brother places like acoustic guitar song. Like I'm watching Cal Bear. And the two sisters do this like, it's supposed to be a choreographed dance. It's but like, they're so out of sync. They're out of sync in this dance where it's like a lateral, like they're moving back and forth and their hands are kind of flailing. Yeah. And they move like their feet up and down. And then like the one sister says she's tired. And this is what I want to ask you. Does the other sister do the dance from Footloose? No, actually what she does do is she continues to dance and does the maniac flash dance. 
from Flashdance. Oh, that's it's, what it is. Okay. It's just like the Michael Sembello rendition of Maniac for Flashdance. Okay. I knew it was some like dance like that. I, I just yeah, didn't remember what it was. Her, but like she tries her best. I mean, she tries as good as she can, but she comes off looking like she's humping the floor and running in place like she's having a spasm. <laughs> Which is exactly what she's doing. And then she just chows down some cake. Yeah. Because, like, that's tiring work, all that dancing. Her mother and her father are just looking at her like, what the fuck? Did you go off script? <laughs> so, yeah, so she chows down on the cake. So the scene shifts to the older sister in the bathroom with a dumbbell on the sink. And she wails on her face, knocking out not only her dog tooth, but I think two other teeth in the process. Yeah, she like, knocks out like another tooth or so, like a couple of incisors. Yeah, it's actually, it's pretty crazy this scene, because like, she smacks herself and blood shoots onto the mirror, and then she hits herself two more times, but like, it's like she so wants this dog tooth to come out, it almost looks like she doesn't even register pain. That's a good point I was gonna make. She doesn't even scream. Like, the thing is, like, she, she does like, wince- at times, I think, but she doesn't, like, scream. She just, like, literally just... Keeps going, yeah. Three like, times, you see all the blood in the sink, and she just smiles. A bloody mess, she smiles, she realizes she finally got rid of her dog tooth. So now with her dog tooth out, she can leave. So she sneaks out the house, she sneaks through the lawn, and she goes into the trunk of her dad's car. Yep. And then you get a weird scene here. The younger sister starts licking her father's hand. He's, like, in bed sleeping. She yeah. She gets... On top of him. And licks his chest. And licks his chest. He's got hair. He's got his hairy chest. She's just trying to wake him up. He, by the way, is the heaviest sleeper I've seen since you. Wow. Because, like, he sleeps through her straddling him and licking his chest for a while. He does wake up. He lightly He does eventually, back. yeah. She's like, will you give me the harpoon gun? He's like, the harpoon gun is dangerous. He's like, do you want me to lick your ear? He then walks in the bathroom and he notices the blood and the mm-hmm. teeth in the sink. Thing is, the dog tooth never grew back, so she's technically not safe to leave in a car. No, but she's just doing it. I don't think she cares anymore. She's like, the dog tooth is out, it'll grow back eventually. So the dad goes on a search for the sister while the rest of the family barks at the front gate. So he's going out, he's looking in the premises right outside the house, there's like nearby woods. And the whole family's out there, and they're just woofing at the edge of the yard. They're Which woofing. is just, it's so creepy and weird to see this. Obviously, they don't find the sister. Like, she's well hidden in this trunk. The remaining sister and the brother do the only thing that really they can do at this point. They mouth kiss and hug in bed. Of course. Why not? We find out that their dog will be probably coming back soon because he's on his fifth level of completion, most likely. So the next day, the father drives off and he parks his car and enters, I'm guessing, his office building? That's what it looks like. And then the last shot of the film is a lengthy shot. Focused on the back of the car, the trunk in particular. And the whole time you think the daughter's going to pop out of this trunk. And it just rests there and it ends. And I have a feeling she dies in that trunk. Yes, that was what I was going to ask you. So there's a couple of things and I read a lot of people's interpretations of this ending. So interpretation number one, she dies in there. She suffocates in the trunk. Or just bleeds out. Or just bleeds out. Theory number two, eventually she does get out. And she gets to explore the world in a way that she either will or will not be able to respond to because of her deep isolation and the fact that she thinks phones are salt shakers and the sea is chairs. and All three of them, if they were to ever be reintegrated into society, would need years and years of assisted living and therapy to understand everything. Because they're already at like an older age. Because their minds are right. It's mended right. It's like, it's so hard. They're past the development stage. It's like, you're rewiring stuff that's already finished. Look, in the beginning, like, he does mention, like, some mathematics to them. So I don't know if the mathematics, it seems like the mathematics stuff he was teaching them is correct. But, like, everything else was wrong in terms of, like, what things are, how you say certain things. Mm -hmm. And and just, like, overall their behavior is just not going to mesh with traditional society it'll be really interesting integration process the ending is left up to interpretation for sure but all in all it was a very different film very unsettling i guess a good way to describe it would be claustrophobic the director got this idea because i think he had friends over who were like recently getting married and he had doubts that marriage could like really exist or just he just didn't like the institution in general so he's like how about i create this overprotective family to just ruin his friend's marriage i don't know about that Nah, it does take on this whole like tyrant philosophy like we said at the beginning where it's like you have someone telling you what to do but it's essentially like it's a movie where it's like trying to purvey like think for yourself in a way yes yes don't always listen to the person above you figure things out on your own don't always blindly listen 100 percent. people got to do their own research and figure out things for their own some interesting things about this movie it was 
shot entirely with one lens, an anthropomorphic lens with 50 millimeter focal length, and they got this ginormous house and big yard purposely because the subject matter was so like claustrophobic. They thought this was the choice set to you know shoot this movie. This was also the first film from Greece to be officially selected for the Cannes Film Festival in over a decade. Really? Yeah. I think this movie also might have been up for an Oscar, right? Well, it was released in 2009, but I think you said the 2011 Oscars. Yes, it was up for Best Foreign Picture. God, I wonder what went over it. This movie was incredible. I I would have to see what else was up, so. My rating for this movie. I'm going to say a 7 out of 10. It's different. I really can't say there's many movies like this one. No. It's really awkward. Tough to see certain scenes. I like it. I don't think it's like this great movie. I can't go above and beyond to like an 8, 9, 10. But I really liked it. So, yeah, yeah, it's a a 7. Yeah, no, I agree. I have it as a 7 as well. But, I mean, I really do like it. For me, it's actually like a really strong 7. Because it's very, very unsettling. It's very, very uncomfortable. The director does a great job of creating... So much like good awkward pauses Mm -hmm. in between the scenes. It's a very sexual movie and there's a lot of nudity involved. And those sex scenes are so like fucking so uncomfortable to watch. Because you know the actors are actually like having to do this stuff. And it's just like so like it's like. Yeah, you applaud the actors. You always wonder, like, how uncomfortable it is for the actors oh my who God. are, like, sitting there doing that. It's all thrusting. Freaking flailing. Yeah. It just, even when they, like, they're naked staring at each other, it's, like, it's just awkward. Like, and, and, it's awkward for me to watch. I can only imagine for them filming. Yeah, no, for sure. He does it in a way that it's, it's super creepy. Like we said, this is not a horror film, but there's horrific images it's, in it. Yeah, it's unnerving. There's horrific images tense scenes in it from the the creepy dancing scenes to the obviously the really hard sex scenes and also just the overall idea of the family just being this in isolation and just completely reteaching yeah their kids it's sick it's very sick that's the best way it's 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 sick where it's like what they're doing to these kids is so messed up so like in a way it's almost like a horror movie yeah it's on Shutter, like I said, so... It's just interesting how, like, Killing of a Sacred Deer is a horror movie and this is not. I consider it a horror movie. Yeah. I think it's more of a horror movie than Killing of a Sacred Deer. Me too. Like, there's harder scenes to watch in this than that movie. Without a doubt. So, with all that said, next week, me and Brian are going to do something very different. We're going to review a horror movie, but it's not known by probably almost anyone. I think on IMDb, like, people who rate it, is under a thousand. Yeah, so it's not a very well traversed motion picture. Yeah. This by far is the lowest budget, because I don't think there is one, like lowest scene movie. We just want to do something different. Cause this is a movie we watched as kids in 2009. Like it really is what got us started into really it, going into horror it movies. Did. It hits home. It was one of the first ones that we watched. I know the movie was made in like 05 that came out in 2009. So we got to see it right when it actually came out, like straight to DVD, and it was probably even had enough money to put them on DVD. But. Agreed. So the movie we're going to talk about is called Rise of the Scarecrows. Rise of the Scarecrows. And I'm going to say it now. The movie is currently available to watch on Amazon Prime. And Tubi. Good. Because I really think that everybody should watch this prior to our episode especially. Because going along with what we're going to say is going to be very, very funny. It's a comedy horror. And I actually think it's supposed to be a straight up horror. It just is that bad. It's a funny movie. It's, yeah. a, good, it's a good piece of art. And we're looking forward to discussing it. Yeah, it's so bad just please sit through it and watch the whole thing before listening to our review because you won't be disappointed no i think they're gonna enjoy it thoroughly i think it's a thoroughly enjoyable film yeah so we're two guys one necronomicon signing off and we will see you next week at the maxwell drip house And if you haven't already, please follow us on Facebook at Two Guys One Necronomicon. Also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Two Guys One Necro. Also, if you can, and if you listen to it on Apple Podcasts, please throw us a rating on there. One star, five star, whatever it is, just let us know your feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs>